So, for Spoken, basically a meme on the internet now. People consider it to have single-handedly killed Luminous Productions, though that's not quite how that works. It, uh, doesn't paint quite a good picture for Square Enix, along with several other problems, you know, yeah. It's a good thing Final Fantasy XIV basically pays for everything at the moment. Speaking of Final Fantasy XIV, the title of this video, that's real. Back when we were all a little more innocent, Forspoken was going to be our fourth expansion, the one that later ended up being Endwalker. It was right around the time we were all gearing up for FanFest. A copyright listing for Forspoken sounded exactly the kind of name they would use for how the story was going, with how high the stakes were getting. And then it ended up being entirely wrong and all of us who thought that was the name felt a little bit foolish. But you can see it follows the expansion naming scheme, right? After A Realm Reborn, every expansion follows a pretty rigid pattern. It's basically two words smashed together. Heaven, Sword. Storm, Blood. Shadow, Bringers. Four, Spoken. You know, it was a pretty reasonable thing to assume that, oops, copyright accidentally leaked the expansion name. Meanwhile, I don't know if any of the expansions have had their name found by anyone, so like, yeah. Hindsight says it was pretty foolish to think this was the next expansion, but it was hyped that we had our first glimpse of what the new expansion would be, even just a name. We were used to leaks by now, and this was at least something not entirely being a leak. But of course, then we got what this game would actually be, and... I do magic. Kill jacked up beast. I'll probably fly next. Oof. Yeah, this kind of torpedoed any goodwill the game had built up with its previous trailer. Even if the gameplay was exactly the same, gaming as a whole gave up on Forspoken because of this dialogue. Not me though. I still wanted to see the game. I still wanted to play it. I even applied for a key for the game. Didn't get it, but still planned to play it anyway. And then, uh, I just didn't. It wasn't anything to do with the game, the dialogue. There were even some clips floating around now that the game was out that had some genuinely funny dialogue, or anything but just, I didn't buy it. I don't even remember what was going on in my life at the time. All I remember is I just kept hovering over by and never did. I could say it was the steep $70 price tag. This was one of the first games touting the price increase that is now already far too common. But no, it wasn't even that. But hey, at least I've gotten the game for under $30 now as a result. Not like my one copy purchase would have been the difference, and I doubt many more people would be convinced to buy the game even after a review of it, even a viral one. I throw my hat, I kill jacked up turtles, <laughs> I'll probably be a, a friggin' dinosaur next! I'm seeing friggin' giant animals and I'm talking to a raccoon?! But what if this game isn't so bad? What if it might even be good? From the demos we saw, the gameplay still looked quick and fun. I could at least maybe mute the voices and keep everything else if the dialogue is that bad. Ultimately, the gameplay is what matters most to me. Story can ruin a game for sure, and it sure seems like that happened to this one. But I mean, most people dogpiling didn't even play it. Those who did? Well, we're about to find out if I agree with you. And you know what else didn't have the greatest reception? Maybe not quite as bad a reception, but Harvest Stella! And that game is my game of the year for 2022! That game kicked ass! Like, man, screw the haters! That game had flaws, but it was so unique and so kick-ass. So, I'm going to play Forspoken. I'm going to aim to even complete Forspoken. And we're gonna go through it together. Not just the intro, not just the demo, the whole game. For better and for definitely worse. Let's review Forspoken. Prepare for spoilers if the length of this video isn't telling enough. If I can talk two hours about why Paper Mario the Origami King is bad, I can talk forever about a game like this. In the meantime, please hit the like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment, check me on Twitch, Twitter, and my Discord. You ready? Let's go. Wait, did I say forever? No, I didn't mean that. No, stop! The game starts with Frey in a courtroom. Aw oh man, I love CSI. Frey has done some crime and is being given one last chance because of a judge we will probably never see again. Outside, we take a short walk and get grabbed by our best friends. Look how friendly they are. 
After a running away tutorial that controls terribly, and I haven't encountered again in 10 hours of gameplay, we get away and get home for some exposition. And a cat. Cause cats are the most important. But otherwise we learn through this that Frey is homeless. From the looks of it, she's a squatter. And in some deep trouble. Been so busy recently. Oh, well, you know. Important things to do. Riding court, slaying dragons. I'll let you in on a secret, but I'm a pretty big deal. <laughs> Real big deal. Everybody needs me. She's also shown to be lacking in brain power because she leaves a bag full of money open, visible, and burning to ash instead of carrying it with her to find the cat. I know isekai stories have had a very low bar for a long time, but really? Just gonna leave it there? And lose your only way to leave town? Okay, I guess. Cat wasn't gonna be in less danger just because you ignore it. But with what little shelter she had gone, the money gone, and Frey in shambles, she gives away Homer the cat to the judge. Oh, they proved me wrong. This is where she disappears. And goes to sulk. Between considering to unalive herself and doing whatever the job is her friends want out of her, she sees a golden glint. Goes to it, and then gets isekai'd. So our intro is about how unhappy Frey is, how much she hates New York, how she basically has nothing to care about except for her cat, and how she's up against a wall. So, keep that in mind. Can't wait to be any other place but this. On the other side, she's immediately trying to get back home. So I said keep it in mind, but that was fast. Do you remember what I said to keep in mind? Because the game seems to have already forgotten. Even before she knows this place is, like, good to be in, she wants out. This place could be literal paradise and she's trying to run back home to a place she hates. A situation she hates, and all that. So yeah, keep it in mind still, we'll be coming back to this. So Frey steps out onto the balcony of this place she's in, and we start to be talked to by Stewie Griffin. This evening is ruined, the whole evening is ruined. This is Cuff, or Vambrace as Stewie tries to get us to call him, which is kinda... Gordon, maybe, Vambrace. Oh, Vambrace, Van... Yeah, up until here, the dialogue is kind of fine. Everyone knows how bad the dialogue they used in the trailers is, and those lines... Yeah, okay, that is something I do know. Those lines are real, and bad, but it's not every line. But hey, at least she's excited after a super downer opening. I thought I wanted out. I was wrong. I was in a bad place. <laughs> So we see a dragon, get out of the castle here, and get our first bit of combat, where we don't have a dodge button. The game doesn't make a good impression with not having even a basic dodge, even putting us against a sort of mini boss until it gives it to us. Technically it's tied to our sprint parkour skill, but they could have given us a basic dodge button to start. Blows up pancakes with mine. My fucking pain. So we run away, take a nap, and get attacked by the final boss. I mean, I don't know it's the final boss, but this being so beefy on the HPN and having mechanics and all that, it sure feels like a final boss kind of thing. And oh boy again, not a good sign. That bear has way too much HP for a first encounter. This dragon has way too much for a second. This is our tutorial. It being a boss doesn't mean it should take me five minutes. After a second phase of the game blatantly tricked me into dying to... We get carried off to the main town of the game, Sepal, and immediately thrown back into court. Oh boy, I love NCIS. Luckily, we only get thrown into jail in the Helix Tower of Pizza. Did that piss bucket do something to annoy you? I mean, I could name a couple of reasons. Immediately rescued, we get told to wear a disguise. Her vestments are strange. Where is she from? You. I, uh, I think You're this world hasn't heard of stealth before. Because I fail to see why she puts this on, only to immediately take it off when we get away. You live in a bar. And then in the morning she gets a change of clothes, just to still not wear the shawl, run into a guard who recognizes her, 
run into one of the councilmen who jailed her, and all around lets everyone know her face. Anyway, this is Auden. She saves us, believes that Frey is from another world. She will give us information on how to open a portal home, in exchange for a different book outside the town. She can't go out because, I mean, did you see that bear and the dragon? This is because the Calamity... Sorry, the Corruption, or as Frey calls it, the Break... ...taking everything over. If someone goes into the Break, they turn into a zombie. However, Frey is for some reason immune to the stuff. I mean, she lives in New York. They basically survive the plague every day. That's nothing special. You just should have eaten your vitamins, sheeple. But okay, let's leave the town and... Oh right, the kid. The night before, she tried to steal Frey's phone. Frey takes to her immediately, and it's pretty obvious why. She's used to doing this kind of stuff. They're both orphans who are basically homeless. The game does put a little bit more effort into it than that, but it's a pretty simple relation. But it's enough to understand the connection and why Frey would care. It's literally more than Paper Mario has tried since Super Paper Mario. And now she's gonna teach us crafting. This allows us to slot in buffs into our equipment for some materials which we find in the world. Typical open world fodder kind of things, at least to start out. It's kind of just whatever. But I'll get into this later down the line when there's more to talk about. So we go out for our first real gameplay section. We have a basic toolkit now. A rapid fire stone throw that kind of sucks but has a decent range. A shield that kind of sucks. And a basic chargeable attack that seems to be way better than any of the others. We also have parkour that lets us do a shockwave stomp sometimes when it feels like letting you. Oh, and a downstab that also works when it feels like. Okay, no, this one I didn't understand for a while, because as far as I could tell, the game did not explain it. But down here is stamina. These three diamonds. Using your sprint slash dodge will cost one stamina. Using the slam will cost half of your maximum. And even when you have stamina, it still seems to not want to work. And using a down attack will cost one. It's a very strong attack. But given how aggressive enemies can be, often being able to instantly strike with no windup, you can easily just not have any stamina this early on. And with how there are usually groups of enemies, and you can knock down multiple at once, you might not have the stamina to stab them all. It's also very much worth going for. The damage is quick, has invulnerability frames as far as I can tell, and it hits really hard. If you have the space and stamina to do it, it's very much something to go for. But depending on how far away the enemy is, if any other enemies are in the way, and how far you knock the enemy back, you will need two stamina. One to start your sprint, and one to do the actual attack. At the very least, if you don't hit zero stamina, the regeneration is very fast. When it comes to the overall combat, I'll again talk about this when it makes more sense. It's just right now the stamina system is kind of making learning the combat a lot harder. So we go out to the tower, do some open world stuff, meet a beast that I could kill if I took like 20 minutes. Yeah, I guess this is a late game task to go hunt these for super important rewards, specifically the kills, since they suck at guarding the chests placed nearby. It really is just the basic affair to start, but it's a super walled off section just to get you some learning. Like, a proper open world tutorial. And oh god, this weird labyrinth bonus area. This thing kind of sucked, all because a water boss that makes it that your, like, super move attack can't reach it. And falling into water is super annoying. At least the necklace equipment was worth it. Reaching our destination, we find a tutorial about nail equipment. A tutorial that explicitly says that only Tantas, basically the ruler gods of this world, can make use of the magic nail art. Magic nail art that we can now start using ourselves. So I wonder why Frey is so special. I wonder. I wonder. Anyway, upstairs we find a crazy man. Rather than finding the journals of Auden's father, Robian, we find Auden's father. After we spend a bit of time getting this big backstory about he disappeared and is probably dead. No, he's just crazy. And often feels like really poor attempts at comic relief. If this is meant to be an earnest showing of madness and meant to be something you feel bad about, yeah, no, it's kind of failing for the first while. The tone of the dialogue is just not there. It's because of what I call the marvelization of media. 
Marvel got so huge with their expanded universe and all their smarmy characters to the point that everyone tries to copy it. This is a common idea in media criticism these days because so much media is falling into that trap. And this game very, very much feels like it is trying to follow that. When they are actually trying to write Frey, give her realistic lines, she sounds really good. And when they aren't, it's very hit or miss. And I think everyone knows the misses by now. I feel really bad for her voice actress because when she is given something to work with, she knocks it out of the park. She is a really good actress and the script definitely just fails her at so many turns. But the real thing that's been bothering me has been Stewie Griffin on Frey's arm. Frey might have been okay by herself. They would have had to try harder to make more reasonable quips and lines. Instead they just chafe by existing together. They don't bounce off each other in a fun way usually. They try to set him up as some sort of mystery where you learn about why he was turned into a weird cuff. My bet is he's Frey's father. But in the meantime he really is just an unlikable asshole. He's not Tony Stark. He's just painful. And he sounds so bored. Like even the voice actor was bored doing this. Like obviously that's just the directions he was given. But god if that isn't grating to listen to. This isn't quipping and whining at Frey, it's directed at the script. If they played it more straight, that he was just a genuine asshole and not trying to be an Iron Cuff Man, it'd be more interesting to listen to and make Frey just a bit more basic sassy girl instead of trying to be Marvel and maybe give her a reason to actually want to go home. We spend a lot of time talking about how she wants to go home and every time Stewie asks about it, or even mentions how shitty a time she was having back in New York. He's right, he's just right, and she has no answer to that. Things aren't that much better here, but that doesn't seem to really factor that hard into her going home. She's being implicated as a demon, under attack from monsters and the Tantas, and generally not having a good time. But that's not factoring into why she wants to go home seemingly at all, at least not yet. But the first time she actually gives a reason to go home is a piece of overworld dialogue you could easily miss if it came at a bad time, not a cutscene. So why is she so insistent? The only one she cares about is a cat who is in seemingly safe hands. It's not like this is Sword Art Online. She's not Kirito with a little sister back home who loves him and wants him to wake up. Okay, I take it all back. Forspoken is at least written better than SAO. And if that's allowed to be as huge a series as it is, none of you are allowed to criticize Forspoken for anything Frey says, no matter how stupid. I just move shit with my freaking mind! <laughs> yeah, okay, that is something I do now. I do magic, talk to sentient cuffs, kill jacked up beasts. You know what? I'll probably fly next. Okay, I take that back. After talking a bit to Robian here, we get a confrontation. Frey is under attack by automatons sent by one of the Tantas, who is afraid of her showing up. I wonder who Frey is. I wonder. This fight takes a long time between getting used to the control still and our damage just completely sucking. I picked hard mode and I'm glad I didn't pick very hard. This first section is just painful with how weak you feel. And then enemies with a defensive shield makes combat even longer. We kill the robots, get thrown out of a tower, and we wash up somehow on the other side of a giant rampart. Making it back to town, we head on into, well, chaos. Tantasyla has come to town seeking Frey. We tell Olivia to go hide, then go confront Syla, who is currently killing Auden. We interrupt her so she blasts the townspeople? I mean, I guess this is to emphasize how she's gone crazy, but okay, sure. Boss fight time. We have to shoot the wings and specifically her wings to do any damage. And she has quite a lot of HP, but this one makes a bit more sense than the dragon did. It's our first real boss. And our reward is an entire stamina, which apparently is 100 as far as calculations go. Surveying the carnage, we find Olivia. She had a wonderful hiding spot of in the crowd. That seems a bit contrived as she seemed smarter than that, but well, she's dead. And this sets Frey off big time. The real problem with this plot point is how soon it happens and how we've had a whole three interactions. 
It's clear Olivia sees Frey as a sort of parental figure, and with how little either of them had had anything good in their lives, the two of them being close this quick does make some sense. But it's still too quick to be believable for most people. The pacing is too quick. In the morning, Auden gives us the book since we brought her father home, and she is really, really, really grateful to have her father back. I want to emphasize this really hard. She is extremely grateful that the father she thought was dead is now home. Remember this. The next hour and a half of game time, yes that much, is all spent here in town because there are a lot of detours and events. Detours are our side quests and events are just tiny little interactions. However, all of them will fail and disappear respectively if you finish the chapter. You are very strictly time limited. So when a whole ton of it all opens here in this section, I have to do it all now or lose out on EXP and rewards. This might be why the game's side quests are kind of not really a thing at all. Side characters have very little to no development. There's so few actual side quests, with one of Chase a Cat for 20 seconds being copy pasted for a total of 9 quests. So at least you can fail them without feeling you missed too much. So we take a toy with this fellow, feed some sheep, Fluffy. chase a few cats, you can pet the cat in Forspoken, get hit with the trolley problem, play some Among Us, then get hit with a crazy man with an axe. Yeah, again, this feels like a joke rather than a serious thing. Even when we understand why he is doing this, this moment makes no sense at all. We see how Auden works on the tree. You can make it out to be the people not understanding a literal madman without giving him a goddamned axe. They're overselling it. Though, maybe it's just me. Now we head to the archives and... Catch. Johiti here prepares us for assaulting Silas Castle. With a... mixed result. <laughs> but no. I doubt you'll actually succeed. But the important part of all this is the blue glassed bookshelf. These are special challenges for every single individual spell to both power up that spell and your magic's overall score. Or purple magic plus one. You may pick only three challenges at once, which is a bit of an annoying restriction. But each challenge can be wildly different, and some of them really, really suck. It can be simply to use the spell, to killing three enemies at the same time with the spell, which before you power your magic up, that kind of thing is hard. Must be why they have these giant hordes of zombies in the world. Challenge fodder. This is why we are so weak to start. That and gear, which again, later. We have to upgrade our magic by doing these challenges. And the difference between pre and post upgrade is kind of huge. So from now on, we're gonna need to be constantly cycling these out to do new ones. Luckily, every rest spot in the world has these bookshelves. But that means we need to be constantly altering our playstyle just to suit what the challenge asks of us. Including, but not limited to, getting hit on purpose. Like, I get it that a skill specifically made for getting hit and taking less damage from it would naturally be trained by getting hit. But the game also has a ranking system for combat. If you do good, your ranking goes up to S, or star, I guess. This doubles your rewards, so you have to tank your ranking just to get this skill upgraded. But again, it increases your overall magic level. Increases in the overworld are scattered about and are worth plus one. Upgrading a skill boosts its power and gives plus one. So it adds up and it very much does add up tangibly. So skipping a skill that might even get a super useful secondary effect, I'm not going to skip it. So while I go out, I have to do these tasks, no matter how specific. Also yes, I'm explaining skill upgrades before skills, but I blame the game for that with how it presents things to you. So now we're prepared for our first real adventure and, oh god, there's more detours. This is about one hour into the 90 minutes of town exploration, by the way. So this expanded the length of town time by 50%. Eventually, we finish in town and can head out towards Silas Castle. This is our first real exploration section, even more so than the one to find Robian. 
This section of gameplay up to confronting Syla took me six hours. Six whole hours. But I did do so very much along the way. Just about everything I've come across in this section. I wanted to unlock and upgrade my powers. So now seems like a good time to get into how the game plays. Your main spell is on R2. Warrior support spell is on L2. R1 and L1 will swap between spells of the respective types. As mentioned, you have three main spells, to which I only ever found the burst shot any use outside of some very fringe uses. Shield kinda doesn't even work as a shield until after you upgrade it a bit. And the speedy stones is just a sniper shot for the rare bird enemies when they're flying far away. Each of these main spells can be upgraded to level 3. Tapping the R2 button will have you use a basic stone throw, while holding the button will begin charging your selected main spell. You can also buy the most important upgrade in the game. Hold the button to instantly fully charge a main spell after any other attack. Use the support spell, hold R2 to instantly charge the spell, even at level 3. Use your parkour attack, hold R2 for an instant charge spell. And this applies to every main spell, including the ones you get later. Yeah, spoilers, we're stealing the other Tauntus magic. So combine this instant charge ability with a medium rank nuke at level 3? And the other two options kind of seem like trash, huh? Anyway, support spells are cooldown spells. Most of them have long cooldowns, but are still very strong. You have a short-lived turret that is god tier for killing birds, a landmine, healing options, a lot of variety. Doing damage with an inactive cooldown in the active slot can massively speed up the cooldown. Though that might be one of my gear buffs. I've been wearing the same gear all game, but I'll get into that in the second Tanta area. So combat ends up boiling down to spamming R2 while cycling through cooldowns, leaving your favorite ones in the active slot for boosted recharge rates. But also remember you need to be using everything for the challenges, so there is some forced variety. And then there's this top skill. Each set of magic comes with an ultimate ability. Doing damage and such will slowly charge the skill until it becomes available. This does huge damage in a huge AoE and can be used by holding R2 plus L2. At level 3, you can make it do three sets of damage. This is super important for wiping away entire hordes of enemies or doing major damage to a boss. We can also swap elements on the fly with the tap of the D-pad. You can seamlessly swap between your different spell sets. So taking down different enemies within groups, you can take down any small fry with one spell set, while focusing down the big threats with the other. And with how many support abilities are just general benefits, you can pop over to a specific spell set for some of its support abilities to boost your other spell sets. The closest comparison to what I've heard this game described as is Final Fantasy XV but more polished. And as someone who actually thinks Final Fantasy XV was good at launch, yeah I can agree with that. I'd much rather take Ignis over Stewie here, but the gameplay follows a similar flow. Dodges hold a button, some stuff is undodgeable, you can jump and bounce around a bunch, but the flow in the combat, with some hiccups here or there, is very much there. When you do something awesome, it even looks awesome. You feel good for taking care of a horde while dodging enemies left and right, or tearing one of the bosses apart with little effort. It wasn't easy, but you just clowned on them and had a blast doing it. The main issue is the moments between. Movement is actually also super cool, but I need to talk about that in the next section as well to prove the point. But the activities are kinda... not much. Most of them are go here, kill stuff. Which, yeah, fine. You're not weighing us down with pointless minigames like cat stealth. And also Ubisoft towers you don't have to climb. Thank god. Often they're at the top of cliffs, but it makes them better fast travel points this way, not just to be annoying and a harder to reach goal. You also have to buy your skills. There is an EXP and leveling system in the game, but that feels secondary. You level up decently fast, but I kind of mostly ignored it after a while. Levels only give you extra mana as far as I can tell. Mana is how we unlock skills for each new toolkit, and you do need a ton of it. A good 400 per skill set if not more. Most of this comes from overworld exploring. Some objectives will just give you a handful of mana, like a level up, but dotted everywhere, especially in Praenost, are little blue lights flowing out of the ground. This is one mana each, so you're going to go out of your way to walk through the blue light every time you see one, because if you don't, you're not getting most of your skills. 
you can't start upgrading them with spell challenges and you end up overall weaker. Making you do content to level up is fine, making you earn spells is fine, but the little lights are really the best and most common way to earn mana. I'm pretty sure EXP also drops off. Enemies giving less EXP the higher level you are. So if you don't farm mana, you fall behind in how much you can buy. I did enough in the game to get all achievements, which meant a lot of content after prioritizing unlocking and upgrading all my skills. I hit level 87 and had collected over 700 excess mana. That is quite a lot. So on the bright side, if you pace your skill unlocks, you will easily get them all. Key words, pacing yourself. After refunding all the skills I was allowed to refund, the game lets you refund skills for 100% the cost. A cool enough feature if not really useful at all. I would estimate you need 3300 mana to buy every skill. I would have had a full 4000 had I sold all the skills I could get. This is an assumption though. That's a lot of mana, which means a lot of farming to access your brand new skills when you get them. I'm going to be going into more detail with gear, but the costs hamper the power level of the new skills. You have to farm to buy them, farm to upgrade them, and then maybe they're about the power level of the very flexible starting toolkit you've been using for hours and hours. It's a lot of work just to be reasonably allowed to use a new set of skills in most situations. Collecting the mana is also too precise. There is a piece of equipment that increases your range for picking up mana, so you don't have to walk directly into it, just next to it. But where is it? Go find it. It's somewhere. And I think it was late into the game I found it. So most of the game you'll be precisely running through tons of blue lights to get more skills. Sprinting is often too fast for you to get them all in some spots, so you have to either slow down or only grab a few as you sprint through. This all is not a problem if you can lose yourself in the open world itself. But like, open world has been done to death. Do we really need vast stretches of brown and gray with only a few enemies and mana dotting the way? The movement is fun, combat is fun, but the world itself leaves so much to be desired. Even when I'm enjoying myself, I feel an immense weight of, yep, this sure is an open world game. And when I'm getting that feeling for the entire game, something isn't right. When it comes to Breath of the Wild, I only start to hit that point late into a playthrough, 50 hours in at least. And you can't really say that has all that many more activities than this game. Hell, Forspoken actually has some hugely important improvements many open world games do not have. There's an auto gather. You can just run over a patch of herbs to automatically collect them all. You don't need to hold or tap a button. Touch it and you're done. So it's not like the devs didn't learn from the genre. They clearly learned a lot with how snappy it is, how easy fast travel is, but they didn't learn that big and impressive in size and scope doesn't translate to engaging gameplay. Though at the same time, Link is a silent protagonist. Fi isn't here to tell me one of three different possible lines after every combat encounter, or hear her go, hey, check out these ruins, immediately after I leave said ruins. Maybe if I was just left to my own devices instead of being marveled at constantly, I'd have a better opinion of it. Oh, and I started finding these locked chests which... Oh god, is... This Bioshock? No, not the pipe mazes, no please! Otherwise, yeah, we go around, hit markers, train our stats, and we do train our stats a lot. Between upgrading our gear and doing the skill book challenges, our power level I would say at least triples along the way. So we aren't so piss weak by the time we get to our objective. This alone also makes it way more fun, since we can actually do damage. Then our next issue rears its ugly head. Founts. There was a basically unavoidable one in the first section, and this is our second. This will be our last easily found fount. These will unlock skills, some of which are very, very good to find, but they can be put far off into corners you might miss. Like, one is behind Silas Castle, but you will not find that without explicitly going back there, exploring quite a bit, and only then go back to town like the game is saying you should do. Like, yes, open world game. Yes, exploration good. But for one, locking extremely useful skills to said exploration is just annoying. 
For two, exploring too far is actively discouraged in the early game. There are higher level enemies. There can be zombies, crystal zombies, and bright crystal zombie. But then also some like super brute enemies that not only resist your magic, but have basically as much HP as the tutorial dragon did. And you can just run into these in places. I actually found one spot where there was one of these brutes and I believe the third tier of bird after the Silas stuff. So why would I explore deeper in that direction when I will find more enemies that do my full HP in a single basic attack? Why would I risk exploring any further than is explicitly encouraged when I can't do basically anything? If most every objective is a kill objective, I can't do anything in that area besides run around and hope to find the fount. Then if I do find a fount, I can have explored too early. If I find a Sila fount before I have Sila's magic, I can't use it. The fount is just inactive. I actually found one deep into the game for the final set of magic. There's an entire three hours of late game gameplay of me exploring an entire optional area. Maybe in the post game there will be a reason to come here, but this is all just extra stuff in the main game. And from the moment you get said final magic, you're essentially headed to the final boss already. So you would not come here until post game, meaning my exploration here early was just a bad idea. I should have instead did objectives closer to my main objective. I would have gained just as much, if not more rewards. Then when I come back here in the post game, I could just do the objectives now that it's the proper time for it. But anyway, this fount has a movement ability. We'll still cover the issue with this after Sila. We go into the fort here, kill the first real boss twice, really shows how much stronger we are now, and then continue on to our first real breakstorm. These are now radiant events that we can come across, though this one is scripted. We cannot do any points of interest in a breakstorm. We have two choices in any radiant storm. I'm unsure if it's outlasting it or just traveling far enough from your point of origin. The other option, the one we must do for this tutorial storm, is find cover. So save points normally. This is just annoying. It's just the worst. Having to drop what I was doing to go run to the nearest save point is not fun. At least in say Breath of the Wild, rain doesn't force you to completely stop. You can still continue to climb with greater difficulty. There's also an explicit feature to tell you how long you will spend waiting for the rain if you so choose to just sit and wait. Break storms you have no indicator and you literally can't do anything until you get out of it. I don't know why I want to go home. Cause this place fucking sucks. I do understand but that may have been a bit intense. Intense? That was batshit crazy. I might live on the streets of New York where the cat is company but I would rather be there alone than spend one more minute in this fucking hellhole. Oh hey, they finally give Rhea a real reason to want to go home. While reminding us that she should have had no reason to go home at first. Destruction and corruption are forms of creation in themselves. Wow, you sound like a serial killer. What? Destruction and corruption are beautiful forms of creation in themselves. I don't sound like that. You absolutely sound like that. No, no, you absolutely sound like that. Yeah, see? Two can play at that game. You're fucking stupid. Okay, that was kind of funny. The Frey dialogue, at least. Stewie's retort was kind of garbage, but her line? That was great. When they try to write Frey like Frey, she's actually super fun. Frey can be super great. She's a good character. Stewie Griffin isn't a good character, even in his own show, so why bother putting him here? But back to progressing we go. Basically max out my magic along the way, and make it to Praynost, home of Scylla. We're given two options, the front gate, which is obviously not what you should do, and a back way. I don't even know if the front gate is open, or ever opens. We fight some mooks, make it into the castle, and get a scene. Stewie encourages us to study the paintings in the hall. One of the Purge of the Reddig, a war where Reddig invaded, and one of each of the four Tantas. Tantas Sila, Prav, Olas, and Sinta. Frey spends an extra long moment on Sinta and how her eyes seem so full of love. I wonder who Frey is. I have no idea. But in we go, and it's time for our first major boss fight. Frey lays into Sila for killing a child. 
Which, again, Olivia had so little time it feels a little forced. But let's be real, this is the kind of reaction anyone should have to a child being murdered. Anyone with a basic heart would be able to say, yes, these child killers are evil. Though maybe that's why this game is so unbelievable, since that seems too hard for people in real life to do. And honestly, it's a pretty good boss fight. Even with having a way, way higher power level, she still has decent HP to not immediately melt. She has a decent moveset, and the ad phase isn't a horrible experience. Then phase 3 is pretty cool. You know, besides the fact that she got stuck on this platform toward the end. I could see if I hadn't essentially leveled up a ton, this might be a horrible experience. Depends on how much you might improve over just a beeline to the castle. But we kill her! We win! And she explodes into ash just like a Mega Man boss. Makes sense for us stealing her powers. Oh, no. Frey, no. In the aftermath, Frey is in the middle of an existential crisis. She just killed someone, and isn't sure how to feel about it. Stewie consoles her and rationalizes it, and we're immediately back to Marvel dialogue. This moment clearly plays a part in her character going forward, but once again, when we're not dealing with cutscenes, the game fails to really follow up on it until later. Once it's needed, rather than probably delving into what a non-psychopath would be thinking after killing someone. Stepping forward, we get a tutorial for our new movement ability, a whip. We can attach to distant ledges and special pieces of environment. I'm still going into movement abilities overall in the next section, but know that even for as super cool as this is, I already find issues with it in my trip to behind the castle. I decided to explore more, and glad I did, since I found a fount. One fast travel back to Sepal later, and we deliver the news. But apparently everybody already knows because they're having a party? How the break moves and stuff is constantly lampshaded and alluded to, but we never actively see it move. The corruption itself doesn't seem alive in any way where it feels like it is slowly crawling further. So Paul just is safe for some reason. Johiti isn't convinced though. Killing Sila has angered the other Tantas and we will see soon enough. Until then, we should go party. Frey doesn't want to cause more parties though, apparently. And oh god, the frame rate in this cutscene and area. So I was playing on Ultra up to this point. My PC has an RTX 3080, Ryzen 9 5900X 12 core, and 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's pretty damn beefy. It was pretty constant 60 FPS up to this point with a few dips, but this right here? I dropped it down to high afterwards, just in case. I did hear that the game came out extremely poorly optimized on PC, and that still seems to be the case. I don't know if you've noticed textures popping in and out. There's like an entire setting for increasing memory space for textures, which like, I guess 32 gigabytes is too much for the game to handle with something. Also, this dancing game sure exists. This comes back in the post game for three more levels, and the final level is actually kind of really hard. Luckily, the button prompts are static, so I essentially memorized the pattern after a few runs. Almost got through all three in one try, though. So we go around, talk to everyone, and then get the plot continuation. The corruption has begun to move again, specifically from Avawalet, which is the same door we went out to go to Praynost where Sila was. But either way, everyone runs for the upper city. When we go to check the entrance, there's an entire break storm. There are bodies in the street, and the break has moved really far into the city. Wait, what? Why? How? I know we did anger the Tantas, but how is this happening? How did it suddenly jump through the walls? After all this time? This isn't just a slow creeping. It has even stopped progressing beyond this lower housing area. And spoilers, it doesn't get worse for the rest of the game. Why would the Tantas just take this tiny bit of the city and then... Stop? Why would the corruption itself just... Stop? Frey is hesitant to kill people she just saw transform into zombies and gets attacked a bunch. But ultimately, we're left no choice but to kill them, and it's a good chance to try out our new powers from Sila. It's pretty fun. The powers, that is. Not the killing people we saw turn. One storm later, we leave and head for the upper city. We're forced to slowly walk through the entire area to see the carnage and all the people being sad. Aww, they're dying. How sad. I know I'm being smarmy here, but hey, it's on brand for how the game likes to treat itself, so why can't I? 
We reach the council chambers and get accosted by the flower man here. Since facts are too much for him, he tries to exercise his Second Amendment rights and kill Frey. To which he fails and then just stands there holding his knife. The council leader removes him from his post and sends him off to jail. Johiti starts to lecture us about how we need to go kill all the Tantas, and Frey is not happy about that. She doesn't want to commit more murders, and you know, fair? They might be insane, but she's still killing people who can speak. They're not like the zombies who are completely taken over. Do my eyeballs deceive me? A living human, all the way out here. Welcome to my showroom of the singular and strange. Did that zombie just talk? Okay, maybe they're not taken over. This guy kind of just like turns Frey into a mass murderer. Are all the zombies still alive in there? Or is this guy completely a one-off? I guess we're not supposed to think about it. But like, if we're supposed to feel for our character murdering people, maybe don't make an NPC that muddies the water. Also, this shop is needed for 100%. But anyway, Frey doesn't want to do it. She's an outsider and doesn't want to keep killing. She's a reluctant hero. She literally got sent here against her will. And even if her reasons for going home didn't make sense until she actually said, Hey, this world is kinda shit, that much is very right. It already seems beyond saving, and she never asked for this. Like, we're so used to Isekai all being bright and colorful. Most of the popular ones all seem to be full of wondrous things and such a great time. Even some of the ones where there's literal wars going on. Meanwhile, here we have Tanya the Evil who just wants to get the fuck out. There's no pretending this world is a nice place to be anymore. Even if in gameplay you never take damage from Scylla, canonically, Frey barely survives and has no guarantee of winning against any other Tanta. Even if the game is super, extremely unsubtle about Frey being a Tanta, she doesn't know it. She lived her entire life in New York. She thinks her ability to use magic is because of Stewie. And the game kind of tries to support this from Scylla having her own Stewie we absorb for the fire magic. So like, yeah? Beyond altruism, why should she care? One collapse later, Frey has a nightmare about this. Because hey, turns out a lifetime of things being awful royally screws up how you see the world and other people. Especially people you don't know. Who would have thought? Bad mental states don't just disappear overnight. Wherever I go, trouble follows. Don't say such things. You deserve more kindness than you've been shown. More than you show yourself. Oh boy, can't wait for this line to be shown again in 20 minutes. Definitely not for an extremely ironic reason. For our next town section, we have a couple more side quests, including one from Johiti, which I entirely forgot to do. I assume it would have been a necklace of some kind for a reward. But again, detours are per chapter, so I never went to Praenost. And this failed. With the citywide game of Amogus done, there's not much going on. So soon we're on to finding Robian at the blue tree from earlier. It's now no longer blue, and the break is quickly taking him. It's no use! We have to go to Avawala to get more of the blue tree sap stuff. Oh, that's coincidentally where the break spreading came from. Besides it coming from the same doorway as Praenost. Oh boy, another person trying to guilt trip Frey. I've seen people act like Frey is unreasonable here. But again, the entire fate of the world has been forced on her shoulders. A world she doesn't know, doesn't like, and doesn't care about. She has been extremely consistent since she got here. I want to go home. Gaslighting and guilt tripping her? But she's the unreasonable one? After a bit of overworld stuff, I head to Avoalet for the first time. At least this place is a bit more green than Praenost. So I explore some, hit some objectives, pet some cats, and meet the next set of enemies. Prov's guards are not spear and shield wielders. Instead, they're extremely annoying archers. These are my least favorite enemies in the entire game. She also has a mini boss of her own that... Has a Final Fantasy XIV sound effect? Oh god, how many sound effects are the same as in XIV? Wait, the stone sound effects. Are those also part of the white mage stone sound effects? Oh god, I hear it now. Even if these are different, they sound the same now. Help! But let's talk about traversal. Most of your travel will be spent holding down the circle button, which costs one whole stamina diamond each time. 
It only lasts for a limited amount of time before you need to reactivate Sprint. So holding down circle is most effective, as it will only spend more stamina when the first sprint runs out. It also helps with vaulting over any obstacles in your path more smoothly. We can also get a singular wall jump and the tippy taps as additional powers for free spells, but then every additional spell set, we get more. Fire comes with the whip for grabbing specific things built into the world, gives us a second wall jump, and gives us a like, flash fire buff to the sprint. When we glow at the end of a sprint, you can just tap circle to sprint again without any extra stamina cost. Water magic gives us a surfboard and a like floaty skill. Lightning gives us a vertical set of jumps that serves no real use. Okay. So the game starts us with low stamina, just a sprint move, we had to unlock the other two skills, and only gives us more after significant progress. Once we have fire, we have some really cool movement available to use but we have to go through a huge portion of the game before we get it. I spent more time in Praenost than any other region through main story progression. But then after, we don't get anything else that's cool. Lightning literally is just garbage for movement tech. I genuinely have no idea what the purpose of the leap is. It seems only usable on the ground and cannot be chained into your other abilities. Water? There is no water. There are four places in the entire game that I can think of that have any significant water. Two of them are here in Avawale, with only one of them actually at all encouraging the use of the surfboard. Another is in a far, far corner of Isoria, leading to a, like, super boss kind of thing. But it's a river flanked by normal ground, so you could easily just run up it too. Then finally is an area at the top of Janoon, an area we actually never and I mean, never explore in the main game. If you follow the story and never go somewhere it doesn't have you go to, you don't return until post-game. And honestly, that's the correct call because there's a lightning spell found up here. Which, guess what? Between dealing with the lightning tanta and the finale section, there's no real time to go grab it. Technically you could, but it's right before the final boss and the game very much is expecting you to go into it. The only other place with water is the one water dragon in the labyrinth, which has an overworld super boss version of it. But this is a movement skill. Movement. 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 You cannot use this skill for combat. You have to jump into the air for a potential air shot or land on solid ground. There are no other water enemies and water combat is just not a thing in this game. So this power is still worthless. Then there's the water float. This power is in the furthest, absolute furthest point in the entire game. The far end of Avawala in a fount. This is the literal last skill in the game I got because of how far away it was. And it sucks. It is absolutely garbage. Your speed is reduced to nothing and it chews through your stamina, even the upgraded version. Maxed out on stamina, you only get a good 10 seconds of floating, which is an entire achievement. That's how specific it is. You also don't need this to jump off infinitely high cliffs. Just jump. Then when you approach the ground, hit circle. Hell, you don't even need that. Far as I can tell, Stewie will protect you from all fall damage as long as you have some stamina. So it's super far out of the way, and it sucks. That leaves us with the fire toolkit, which, yeah, this is great. Your combined earth and fire movement toolkit are pretty great. It gets really enjoyable to zip around, especially when obstacle courses are specifically built. But even this has its problems. The whip can randomly just not accurately grab what you're pointing at. You can only grab four things for specific effects. Big rocks and wooden supports on some buildings that launch you straight up, and then pulls of the rock or wood variety. So I can aim at one of the rocks, and it will grab the top of the rock, rather than locking onto the tip of the rock. This lock onto the tip is what sends you launching. If you somehow manage to whip the middle of the rock, you just pull toward it like if you whipped a wall, ground, or an enemy. This happened to me way more times than I like. There's basically no reason not to grab the special object if you whip in even the general direction of it. Making it this inconsistent takes away from the genuine fun zipping around can be. It's a lot like why people like Spider-Man games, 
web swinging around is just super fun. And I say this as someone who played the N64 and PS2 games. Who needs PS4 and 5 Spider-Man? I'm a real OG. Even worse, you can't whip onto everything. Some walls, mostly completely flat ones, do not properly register as targets. This can make climbing an otherwise completely possible to climb sheer cliff face just impossible because the game said so. Sprint straight at it to do a basic parkour leap onto it, dash away from the wall, hold square to slow time and aim at a higher point on the wall to whip it, tap circle to wall jump, tap again to fire wall jump, dash toward the wall and because you're close enough to the top, you'll leap over the edge. But nope, this wall is programmed to not be a whip target. Run for 20 seconds in that direction so that you can climb the intended way. It takes away from the inherent coolness of parkouring around and making your own path. You know, the entire reason people max out stamina first in Breath of the Wild games. So the game fails to hit a balance. It wants to give you more movement abilities as you progress, but after fire you get nothing else useful. Yet you start with so little that the fun of exploring is hampered for a while. And when you do finally have it, you're even still limited in what's allowed. I'm not even expecting to be allowed out of bounds, just going up a cliff to my objective goes against the entire point of parkour. Let's also talk about crafting and gearing now. You have three pieces of gear. Nails, cloaks, and necklaces. Nails I barely used. The first nails you get are kind of some of the best. Pure damage up for fray spells, the ones you spend the entire game with, and a support magic up when your surge is charged. So even though it has a special requirement, it's one you can have active often. Changing your nails does come with a material cost, so you have a really high bar to reach to make a swap worth it. The craft bench is where we do most of the work. We can craft healing items, extra lives up to a max of three, and bag increases for maximum healing potions and how many materials we can carry. With specific skills, we can also craft special crafting items for late game upgrades. And then also that weird zombie shopkeeper will let us craft one special necklace and cloak. So crafting stuff is extremely limited. But eh, I'm not too concerned at that. I'm glad it's not some forced system. It's kept simple and I think that's good. Meanwhile on the upgrading end, we have being able to customize cloaks and necklaces with a huge list of buffs. By gathering new equipment with new types of modifiers or by upgrading your necklaces, you get more buff options. You can slot in up to four different buffs on each piece of equipment. The game deserves some credit for this part, as increasing its stats does not require you to find and use new gear. There's no need to constantly slot in what buffs you want into every new gear piece you find. Notice my cloak in all my gameplay? This is the cloak I've been using since the beginning of the game. Well, from one of the first side quests at least. You can upgrade the stats of your cloaks too. Some of the upgrade skills are locked behind later spell unlocks or even unlocked by founts. Looking at you defense upgrading. But you can pump materials into the stats of your cloak to upgrade your magic levels. So this cloak having a purple magic rating of 30? Well I could just pump materials into my cloak to give it the same power. And that's the only purpose of the items you pick up. So I guess they did half ass a crafting system just to put more stuff into the world. And when you're gathering tons and tons of it and the level caps for most stats is 100, you need to upgrade a lot. And each stat is individually upgraded. So you have to either collect a lot of stuff, which let's be honest, you probably will just by playing, or invest into only one magic color, because each magic upgrades individually. Purple magic only means Earth. So all that time and effort into upgrading during the trip to Scylla means your fire skills are far, far weaker than just spamming stones. Even at earth resistant enemies, you have to pump up your numbers for fire magic first. Then it will be comparable on most things and better on fire vulnerable stuff. But to be an equal in neutral damage, you probably need to go grind up some skill upgrades because remember, upgrading spells ups their power. So by the time I got water magic, I hadn't finished upgrading everything for fire based magic. So I didn't bother using water ever because it sucked. Even with stats pumped to as high as everything else on my gear, stones and fire were just better because I had invested time and energy. I would have to invest more time to get water to be decent. Same for electricity, which you get only for like 10 minutes before the final boss. So I'm not going to use this new moveset I'm not used to because I spent the entire game with stones and half of it with fire. 
I'm going to just use those. They're much stronger. So yeah, sadly, gear has its own problems on top of the super cool option of I can use whatever equipment I like the look of most. And so I did. I like the rugged look with the subtle decoration. I don't want to be flashy. This fits Frey much more. So back onto the story progression. Well, I spent a long time doing stuff in the world first. I had to because 100% achievements was a goal going into this, so grinding everything was not optional. But we get deep enough to find Ballow Trees. The game gives us a tutorial for this for some reason, like they're expecting us to have a real search for it and no icons placed on the map. But no, we just follow the icons and constantly find that the trees are empty. Not a big surprise. This goes on for a while, with plenty of stupid Marvel dialogue along the way. Head up this hill, see what we can see. Up the hill, like Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill? Whoever that might be, just get yourself up there. Eventually, we find a tree that is barely hanging onto a cliff, and it has sap. And despite having magic air dashes, she falls off the tree and gets Stewie fall damage fixed. That's a cannon move. Sadly, we need more tree sap, which means going into the deepest parts of Avoala, refusing a meeting with the Tanta, would seek to kill us anyway. Oh boy, I love Law and Order. And stepping right into a break storm. We're so close to the castle, so yeah, the Tanta is a walking storm. They're that corrupted. It was like this at Silas Castle too, but there was really nothing around the castle to go and collect. Here, there's a couple of things I could have gotten for more stats and stuff, so this one is kind of annoying. One Ballow Tree later, Stewie wants us to go kill the Tanta. Frey is really against killing her, and also again, reluctant hero. But then... You know, countless people will suffer and die because of Prav, don't you? Are you really going to abandon them at their most vulnerable? <laughs> yes, I see. Like Mother Lake. Like what the fuck, dude? That's a low blow! Clearly, it gets him what he wants, and ultimately it's for the benefit of all of Athia, but how am I supposed to be against Frey? Yes, it's true, she has these powers. Great powers, great responsibility, but... Okay, I'm going to hold off on this for a little bit more. Something happens that makes this pretty cut and dry for me. Frey agrees to do it, though, just because maybe there's still a chance to reason with Tanta Prav. Stop the break, and it's over. Because that works so well with Syla. But she wasn't the Tanta of Justice, I guess. She sounds like she's in there somewhere. Such certitude. Such righteous poise. Yet all is demon solid noise. Shit, alright. If you're gonna rhyme everything, then just kill me now. But when we get there... Oh look! She has a Blitzball Arena! Oh look! I wondered... who... Frey was? At least they're not holding on to this for the entire game. Though, justifiably, Frey is unsure how to feel about all this, and still very angry she was abandoned as a child. How do I address you now, by the way? Is it your... your worship, your highness, day? Shut the fuck up. That's my girl. See, look, there's some really good dialogue here. That's a really touching moment. They don't need all this Marvel BS. Just let Frey be Frey. I take some time exploring before heading back to Sepal once again. We weren't on a time limit to Robian's death or anything, right? Protect us. Huh? Oops. Frey is now left with nobody to help her home and... Apologies if my father's death has inconvenienced you. That's not what I meant. I... No? I have lost the father who I only was just reunited with. Who I was hoping to spend more time with. Who was all I had left. I'm sorry that's been so hard on you. No, I didn't... Didn't what? Think? No, your only concern is for yourself. That's... My people have lost... so much. They can't just... Get out of this insanity. This is their home. My home. 
But, but don't let our grief and assured destruction get in the way of your self-pity. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Fair. <laughs> you want to talk about fair? What's unfair is the only person capable of helping us is too self-absorbed to do so. I've shed blood for this place. Our people welcomed you. They were frightened. Rightfully so. But they still welcomed you. They needed me. What's wrong with that? People need each other. We help one another without complaint. It's the Athian way. Not that I should have expected you to understand that. After all, you're not one of us. No. No, you know what? You are right. I didn't grow up here. I didn't have a community that supported me. I couldn't go and drink with my friends at the bar. I couldn't go outside and play with the kids. I couldn't walk on beautiful landscapes. I didn't have a mother or a father that wanted me or loved me. So no, I don't care what happens to Athia. If it's saved or if it burns, I don't give a shit because this place is not my home. Just leave. Leave with fucking pleasure. What happened to being so grateful that she found your father at all? That she constantly puts her life at risk? Murdered for them? She wasn't accepted. The first thing that happened was she was thrown in jail. They were going to hand her right over to Sila without a moment's hesitation for their own selves. She has killed two of the Tantas for Athia. She has gone out specifically to find more sap to save Robian, failing at the task or not. You're going to lecture Frey like this? You're only proving her right. So much for showing her more kindness than she's been shown. Why would she even want to help you? She barely has made it this far on her own, and the moment the favors stop, they turn on her. Thanks for murdering two people, fuck off. Meanwhile, she's dealing with so much shit that Auden doesn't even know. Or maybe she does know, because Johiti seems to know, which would make it ten times worse. Frey is just expected to find out she's a Tanta, born in this world, then abandoned by one of the oh-so-blessed of them, and not bad an eye? No, screw that, screw Auden. Should have found some journal of Robians and just let him burn when Sila attacked. Based on how Auden acts, that's the better option. And then look at Janesh in the jail. Oh, Robian abandoned Athia too, as he found the only known defense against the break. No other ways are known, and his research was to find a cure. But no, he's a traitor and awful. Meanwhile, he's half turned, insane, and still fighting to protect people. But hey, it seems pretty on brand for all Athians to guilt trip and call traitor for not obeying like a slavering dog. From throwing a party to being completely ungrateful after she did just kill a second Tanta. Then yeah, Johiti actually doesn't blink an eye at the news Frey is a Tanta, lecturing her that she should be so grateful for her lineage. Johiti doesn't even have an answer to Frey's comment. An heir to someone that, as far as she knows, threw her away. No family whatsoever. An orphan that society failed. All the pain and suffering she has felt her entire life doesn't just up and vanish when she finds out who her scars were made by. No, the wounds reopen. Every moment of every day comes flooding back. No empathy from anyone. Instead, being told she's wrong just because being a Tanta is a good thing. The same Tantas she's being constantly guilted into killing. The Tantas who are currently killing the people of Sepal. The Tantas who ruined Athia. What being a Tanta means? What it means is a dying world, filled with people who apparently don't respect you at all. We'll claim Frey is the self-absorbed one, while she's in the middle of a personal crisis. Good job pulling a first world problems on Frey. Her problems don't matter. Only Athia's do. Athia being on the brink doesn't change what's going on in Frey's life. All her baggage she's carried her entire life. 
the baggage of taking people's lives. And now she has to deal with more baggage over the woman who abandoned her. Far as I see, anyone who considers Frey in the wrong here doesn't know what the word empathy means. And that's the attitude we leave on. We go to confront Sinta, which Stewie seems to think is a very bad idea. Not just because Frey would leave at first chance, but because she's just that powerful. Which seems kind of weird, when Scylla was the warrior. But as far as giving Frey a genuine reason to go for the quad kill, it's a good one. But a breakstorm sweeps in and... Oh. Well. Something's up. Supports this new startup. It's the day of pretzel. It's the day of Kanish. Oh hey, I was wrong! The judge is back again! Hello, and welcome to the Affian. I'm afraid the coffee here is not authentic and full of artificial sweetness. Oh my god, he really does just look like Stewie Griffin. Yes, the owner is very duplicitous. Get out while you can. Alright, so Olas has illusion powers. She wants to keep us in here, which seems pretty reasonable for her. She's not killing us, but she refuses to be killed. Too bad for her, it turns out Frey didn't intend to kill her. So we have to run through the intro again, but this time with all her powers and stuff. There's these new lantern enemies that just sit there to spawn more enemies. So you just hit the lantern and ignore everything else. It gets a bit more interesting once they start adding shields that require you to kill all the enemies first. But like, there are no new enemies introduced from this point. At least I don't think so. It's all just higher level versions of ones we've already fought. And also for some reason Olivia is there too. As if that's going to somehow convince Frey to stop trying to get out. And oh. Well, at least they're openly confirming what Frey was planning in the intro. But hey, boss fight already! This is a pretty alright boss, though the electric field it has is a bit annoying. The second phase could be a bit better though. The impairments are like, not an issue at all. The notification is actively harder to deal with than the impairment itself. Then it summons clones and just dies on its own. Good job, boss. But we break out, and we're super deep into Visoria. Not even just the edge of it. We are within visible distance to the castle. They skip most of the area. Like, it's not hard to just use the fast travel to ping pong off this central point, which seems kind of odd to me. Especially because I spend a majority of this Visoria chapter in Janoon. The part of the game meant for Visoria, I quickly leave Visoria. To the north is a very, very long corridor that kind of looks like it leads to some kind of finale area. So I explore it, and it's fully open. Not even locked away as some final gauntlet. This is even where the final locked labyrinth is. It has every boss and multiple of them at the same time. This is very much an endgame area, but I kept going. And this is how I found out that founts for spell sets you don't have just don't work. It doesn't just store the unlock for later, you just have to come back. But this is what was some of the most fun was, because there was a ton of parkour and whip chaining, and it's just fun. Unfortunately, it only lasts for so long, and there's not enough variety there to keep it going longer than it goes. So eventually we land for some more combat, and at some point we crossed over into Janoon. More water, more random stuff, but I eventually hit a super boss. It gives me some problems, but not very deadly overall. But I mean, that's all that happens. Some cool parkour, more of the same combat. So then off we go back to Visoria and progressing toward the castle. We have a lamp fight to introduce shields like I mentioned, but it's almost all zombies, barely any threat. So I just head right for the castle basically. And aside from lore and backstory, it's kind of uneventful. There is this giant lantern at the top, but again, it's just zombies. Maybe if the shield went back up it would summon tougher enemies? But I one round it. It doesn't even have HP gating to force two rounds at least. But here we are. Time to get the next boss fight. We are here to confront Olas. Going in? She's already dead. Maybe the illusion world? Us breaking out killed her? But then... Sorry, Frey, but this is where we part ways. Oh. 
And Stewie's entire way of acting changes now that he is his main form. Sacerus, the demon the first Tanta defeated and hid in the locked labyrinth. The Reddick found him and resummoned him for the four Tantas to defeat once more. And I'm in... two minds about this? The dry, seemingly uncaring inner voice is actually evil? Gasp! Given how obvious it was, it seemed too obvious to be what they were going with, so I discounted it for thinking it was Frey's father. Like, I still wasn't convinced he was evil yet because of how he sounds. Like, listen to this. He sounds sarcastic about being the villain. Like, he knows he's her father, but being killed by her is still part of what is needed to save Athia. I can't tell if I was giving too little credit or too much credit. But yeah, there's the shoe drop. Stewie was the villain all along. And we lose our powers. All we can do is try to dodge. And with how we don't have a proper dodge anymore, it's just stand there and take it until the game lets you leave. But then the Fireheart Dragon at the start turns out to be Tanta Sinta. Did... did she attack us because of Stewie? Or was her memory too cloudy because of the break? Like, why is she suddenly all better and able to consciously work with us? Because she was always helping us doesn't work. Getting to Sepal seemed entirely by accident, and she did actively try to kill Frey. But this time, she tosses Frey into a Tirana, and we enter the weirdest part of the game. We end up transported to some... place? Where am I? This is Fargana, the Wellspring. We talk to the souls of the Tantas and learn the full history of the events of the game. As I said, the Reddick invaded and Athia won the war. But Athia was deeply, deeply scarred. Cause I mean, it's a war. An invasion. That's pretty normal. But then came Caesarus, summoned by the Reddick. But he too was defeated and sealed within each of the four Tantas as cuffs. Coolwhip. Demon lived on. Coolwhip. Coolwhip. Taunting us. Coolwhip. But Frey is convinced by Caesarus that she has no powers and that she's worthless. She's no hero, even if she was reluctant to be one. And yeah, hi imposter syndrome, my only friend. But the Tantas insist she does. So off we go on a very unearned adventure of this is the power of Frey, the power of Alfrey, her real name. We get answers as to who Sinta was, the nature of Frey's birth, and everything. It also gets extremely, extremely preachy with way too overly heroic music. Oh, children are awesome. Everyone should be happy to have them. Ah, bull. But time for a world tour of a bunch of different watching of memories as we get all of our powers back one by one. We see the Tantas and their fight to defeat Caesarsus, and that, no, actually, Sinta did love Frey. After a quick mini boss, we get lightning for the first time. Unless we leave in the middle of all this, there is no real chance to upgrade it at all. But we also see the aftermath, the Tanta slowly losing to the corruption of Caesarus. We learn that Frey's father is actually from our world, from New York, and his name is Al. And that's it. We learn so little for this being like a half hour long section. Even the big climax at the end of us witnessing the moment Sinta sent Frey away. Moments from turning, Sinta sends Frey to Earth and Caesarus follows. So he was rotting in that shop for Frey's entire life. But like, why? Did he think someone could send her back here later in life? By the time she grew up, Athia would have already been lost. Would the Tantas not just eventually die? So Caesarus caused his own defeat? Like, Sinta here then implodes and turns into a dragon. He won! He won here! He just had to stay! It's borderline plot hole. Just convinced the crazed Tantas that they need to kill each other. They went crazy from Caesarus himself anyway. So then we see Frey get a chance to talk with Mom. She's still angry, but realizes it was needed. Not that I should have expected you to understand that. After all, you're not one of us. But that sure doesn't get excused. We're given one final choice. Stop Caesarus, or go home. So? I go home! Auden is a bitch. The end, we beat the game! No, of course not. This is that one chance to go out before the finale to go grind or something. 
but because Stewie is gone, you can't use your scanning abilities, which limits you on stuff like the towers that reveal parts of the map. So like, why am I going to hold off? Just do the finale now, and hope the game gives the power as a clear bonus. And hopefully not having to listen to his awfully written dialogue anymore. That'll be a big improvement to exploring the world. But okay, to Sepal. While riding a dragon. Well, Stewie lays waste to it. But everyone is being evacuated into the archives. While we take care of any creatures on the ground. Which is just a really long fight. Makes sense for the finale though. We head up to the archives to check in on everyone. No. To figure out that Afi is your home. Oh, good. She's still being rude about that. And this moment? Yeah, no, I'd still be angry. I thought I couldn't trust you. That you were just using me to get what you wanted. I... But that wasn't true. You believed in me. No. No, you had it right the first time, Frey. I would have liked if they gave us a call on and out dialogue option. But I guess we have no choice. We get one last talk with mostly people who villainized us, hated us, guilted us, and expected us to just take it. Hey, wait, where's Junesh? Is he... Is he still up in the tower? Yeah, they left him in the tower to watch if Sepal gets destroyed. We head out to face our destiny. The destiny of Panzer Dragoon. No, Panzer Dragoon is more complex. This is all we do. Hit R2, point the beam. At least for this first phase. 90 seconds later, we can move on. To a weird, like... 20 second cutscene of the dragon just flying around into a very basic QTE into oops she dead that was the actual sound effect by the way and I'm here to fuck you up. one dead mom later we get a power boost oh you ruined it. This section is basically just free. It's a power fantasy and a chance for you to get used to using skip. This sounds like it'd be super cool for movement too, but no. You can only use it on the ground and can't do anything after just like lightning step. For the second phase, we have a normal one-on-one -on -one in Svargana. And I'd say this is a pretty good fight. He cycles his weakness at specific points, but the forced hits in cutscene are less enjoyable. But also I'm so strong that he doesn't stand a chance. Oh, come on, that's cheap. You're supposed to use skip to dodge it, but the camera's shifting so much and him immediately firing it? Yeah, that's just a newbie trap. But otherwise, it's a fine final boss. One thing I do get is you're not alone, even when you think you are. <laughs> uh, spare me. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was awful? It made no sense and the direction she was given was terrible. Good scream out of the VA, but... Yeah, no, that was dumb. But it's over. Thesaurus is defeated and... Oh. Oh no. He's not gone. God damn it. But honestly, this ending, it's a really, really good ending. Frey seeing the Fallen and coming to terms with her... everything. And honestly, these lantern ceremonies always get me. For even just one moment, Frey can take off the cloak and just... be. Hey, Homer. Sorry, it's been a while. I know. You miss me? <laughs> nah, I bet you got a full belly and a big old smile on your face right about now. Been so busy recently. Oh, well, you know, important stuff. Holding court, slaying demons. I'll let you in on a secret, but I'm a pretty big deal. <laughs> like, actually, I, I'm kind of a big deal now. Everybody needs me. That's a good bookend. I came away from this experience with what I felt was a middling open world game. Nothing too special in the gameplay, but a genuinely fun time. A bit messy in the PC optimization, tons of criticism if this entire video wasn't proof. But this ending, this ending, this is what the game was doing right. They didn't need to go full Marvel. This bookend works 
because it's lines from Frey at her lowest, at the end of her rope, no room to be cocky, only for her to find something in her life, to be able to say these lines honestly and happily, after everything she went through, all the genuine turmoil she went through, she's finally happy. Being sassy is in her nature, but adding in cuff and pushing it to the extreme ruined it. Frey alone could have added so much more depth. I'm being redundant with saying it over and over, because it's just true. Dealing with the people, dealing with her situation, and having it come to terms with it all, this is where the writing is able to shine, when she's believable as a person. Had they focused on this, the internet wouldn't have turned on it. They would have given it a genuine chance. They wouldn't have latched onto what I would say are the worst lines in the entire game. Do I think it would have made Forspoken out to be some huge hit? No, but it would have performed far better. This was not inevitable. People were excited for this game at first, and I believe it really could have been something. Look at me now, huh? Tonta Frey. Daughter of Sinta. Protector of Athens. come back for you. I promise. Just look out for me, okay? See you when I see ya. <laughs> and now the real work begins. Damn! That is a lot of land for just one girl to cover. But it's a good thing I'm not doing it on my own. Isn't that right, Cuff? It's Van Brace. Please shut up. There's a couple of quest lines that open up here in the post game, one leading to what I think is like, Janesh escaping? There's a bloodstain on the wall, but the game seems convinced he's still alive. So sequel bait, I guess. Then also helping people. The dancing minigame, finding a music box in Janoon, and boss refights. Otherwise, somehow the break was pushed out of town and it's unexplained. So the next handful of hours is just cleaning up loose ends. Finding all the founts, all the gear, all the super bosses, and so on. By the time I finished everything up, I had 40 hours of playtime. I was not doing every single goal on the map, especially not getting every single treasure chest on the map. But then it all ends on one final quest. A mysterious woman tells us to head to Visoria. There's a spot at the edge just off by itself. It's an in-game connection to the DLC, In Tanta We Trust. You can access this from the title screen too. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I stopped here, now would I? Approaching this weird light, the voice tells us that to save Athia, we're in for some history lessons. Blacking out, we wake up somewhere new, in the body of someone named Talia, of Olas's personal guard. One of the greatest warriors in Athia who isn't a Tanta. And Talia is in a bit of a pickle. Everything is on fire! We've been transported to the invasion of the Reddig. As we escape, we can tell, if you were paying attention mid-gameplay at least, this is a bridge we crossed in Visoria. We're quickly captured and... Once again, Frey can't use magic. But this time at least is because she's someone else. A Reddick General, Audacor, sticks her with something, and proudly announces that Talia is going to be useful. Then, Blackout. The voice informs us indeed that this is the past, and that we cannot change events. We will get answers to some questions, but what questions we are not told. Waking up in a cell, Talia has a tattoo. That's not ominous at all. This tattoo has also given her magic. Did I just do that? Okay, that's funny. Come on, you can't say they didn't know what they were doing. We have an extremely simplified set of skills. We have one basic stone throw with a burst shot, and the basic fire sword slashes with the big sword swing. Our support magic is similar to one of our lightning spells we barely would have used. And while, oh man, we have a dodge roll, it kind of sucks. Like a lot. I don't even know if it gives any invincibility frames. And good god, we're weak. Even exploiting weaknesses, we barely do any damage. Cuff's abilities also don't work. This DLC is harder than anything in the base game because of how uber weak we are. Luckily, Tanta Sinta shows up and protects us. She would Torana us out, but for some reason her magic is on the fritz. So we have to take the long way. And Sinta is acting kinda weird. 
Why is Talia worth saving? Apparently she isn't. But Cinta does drop that apparently attacking Athia isn't purely for conquest. There are deeper reasons, ones that won't be answered in this DLC. Here we have another sneaking section, since for some reason the game likes having one in the tutorial. Even though this mechanic never comes back. And no, I don't count cat monuments because they work entirely differently. One failure to stealth out later, we have to do a running away section. Something that also was only in the intro once when running away from the like gang members. These really are just weird things to have in the intro, and intro only. But then we have why we're so weak. Talia is a support class. Cinta is meant to be our main source of damage. Our support spells will freeze a target in place with crystals, then we can have Cinta do a limit break. A limit break that gets exponentially stronger with each use of it, up to level 3, and then resets to level 1. This fact took me a bit too long to really get. I was trying way too hard to play like Frey. The moment I started being more support-like, I started having a better time. And then into trouble anytime I stopped. Because Cinta used Salvation a lot. We have so little HP, so little defense, and generally just suck so bad. Cinta needed a built-in heal anytime you go critical. And good god they throw so many enemies at you. There's only two enemy types so far, but we have to deal with like 15 of them in our first major encounter here? We have no chance to really get used to Talia before we're thrown in the deep end. Sink or swim. And I sunk for a while. Though I didn't game over. Yet. Oh boy, spell challenges are back! And our healing potion cap for now is... Four? Four potions? Oh dear. That guy just got squimshed. And so, our first boss fight. Well, not. We can't do anything to it. So we have to just... dodge. Oh boy, I'm so glad they recycled the first Sacersus encounter gameplay. But we linger more on how Cinta is being very, very cold. She basically just let that guy become a puddle, which is very, very unlike her. Something is up. One rough fight later, we see some weird purple crystals. Ones that we know in the future are break. In the next room are some roots that look similar, but not quite the same. And so our first boss fight! Well, not. This is going to become a normal enemy, just like the special knights from Scylla and Prov. This is our elite enemy, I guess would be the term. 24 pages into a script is a good time to write that, right? It's fine. It's actually pretty good as a boss fight. Kinda terrible as a normal enemy to fight. As Talia absorbs the tree root, somehow, Cinta says it's too soon. I wonder what Talia is. Okay, no, I actually didn't know what the twist was here, though I have very little doubt anyone could figure it out early. We just know Cinta is lying and something with Talia is going on. And oh boy, the skill tree has expanded! And wait, why is our parkour a skill we have to spend points on? I guess specifically just to tutorialize something we probably remember from the main game. Like, who the hell plays the Forspoken post-game DLC before Forspoken? Oh well, at least we're only half as worthless as we were before the Elite fight. Outside we get a tutorial on talismans and... wait a minute. I did not find any other talismans in this DLC. Were they in just like, random chests I skipped? Or was the game giving me new ones and just not telling me? Because we never leave the castle area of Vesoria. There's only like, six total objectives to do. None of them popped up with, whoa you got a talisman! Meanwhile every cloak? Necklace and nail paint in the main game would have a dedicated pop-up. So why not here? But okay, outside we see that the root Talia absorbed is for a giant ass tree. This tree is also what is blocking the Tirana teleports out of town. We are trapped in here until we take the tree down. So here's our first goal. Go around, kill the roots, and get stronger in the process. Then also the normal trappings of the main game. Pick up man in the world to unlock spells, Oh, that's something I kind of overlooked in the main review. So, now I'll be adding in that part somewhere. Remember that part an hour ago? But okay, pick up mana in the overworld, unlock spells, take out objectives, and get rest stops. But uh, here's the full skill list. Here's how my skill list looked at the end. All those grayed out skills? They're all defensive boosts. 
I ended the pseudo open world portion too early, thinking the parts after would feed me far more mana than it did. So I had to do the ending section with far less defense. And boy do I feel that, we'll see soon. But even just that one actual defense stat boost probably would entirely change how the rest of the DLC plays. Heading down to one of the routes, we have the Flying Elite Dude. I also didn't realize there was a ton of archers on the walls firing down at me. I figured they were on the ground somewhere, but I hit the heal button, didn't check my HP, and... die. My first official game over. This one is at least my fault. One attempt later, I win. We save some people, get the root, some more power-ups. Yeah, there's not much going on here. It really is just a very, very condensed version of the main game's overworld gameplay, while having the objectives be mostly required to also skip through the gaining multiple toolkits. That half, though, is to keep the gameplay simplified and standalone, even if most of the powers are copies of main game powers. But I clear out every objective, even the optional ones, and head to continue the main story. And good god, this fight is bigger than any fight from the main game. At least I didn't die. We're given the normal warning about phrase adventure, which is a chapter end signal. So go do anything you need in the overworld now. I figured I didn't need to, the rest of the DLC will level me up more, so across the bridge I go. As we approach, the dragon kind of thing comes back to attack all the people in the courtyard that weren't there a few minutes ago. Why are they here? Okay. And Cinta doesn't seem to care people are being murdered behind her, so Talia angrily goes to do it herself, despite not knowing if she can win. And so our first boss fight. Well, not. We can't do anything to it still, so we ineffectually shoot stones at it once again until the cutscene kicks in and Cinta is forced to join in. And so our first boss fight. Well, not. Nah. Wait, this one is actually real. We actually have to kill this one with our new fusion magic. Cinta has an ultra limit break that goes through the shield and can be exploded by us using magic on the same target. This brings down the shield, meaning we can do damage as normal and use Cinta's normal limit break from crystallizing it. Then it just broke. It just is sitting there. I was very confused. It's just staring. Letting me pelt it. Just, yep. But then it breaks out and kills me. And then it does it a second time. And then I kill it. This fight sucks because the light hits will do half your HP and the big hits do your entire health bar. That could be because of these defense skills I never got. So the DLC expected me to grind even more than the base game does. Each of these cost 80 mana. I do not collect enough mana for the rest of the DLC to buy even one of them. But the game does give you more mana. It's not zero, but it's not even close to enough. So what's the point? Maybe the game should have had a different kind of notice? It isn't just a progression warning, but a point of no return. That I should go grind before this boss murders me. Grind at the complete lack of main objectives. All I can do is just kill enemies and hope I find more blue mana lights. So even if I did go grind, even if the game bothered to tell me, I'd have had a bad time. One boss kill later, Aldecor shows up out of nowhere. He tries to turn Talia against Cinta, saying she wants to kill us. In safety, Cinta admits it. The truth of all of this is the tattoo means Talia is a weapon. A bomb, like nuclear level. When the day is over or when Talia dies, she will explode. There is no saving her. So Cinta must extract Talia, take her far away, and kill her. Talia, caring for Athia as much as any Tanta, resigns herself to her fate. She is going to die. Together with Cinta, they will stop Aldecor and kill Talia far away from Athia, much like the first time this happened. Sadly for Cinta, she's dealt with this before. After some heart to hearting, off we go to defeat Aldecor. And honestly, this is a decent section. The parkour is fun, but that has been true from the beginning. The combat? Well, support character Talia is still lacking. There's even less enemy variety than the base game with there being spear guys, archers, and the elite that flies. 
yeah, no new enemies get introduced in this final section. Instead, they just send huge waves of them at us, as if they were the basic zombies in the base game. Sinta can easily tear through them all, so it's not too awful, especially her level 3 attack being just huge. But it's hardly all that interesting, including when they throw three of the elites at you at once. You're just dancing around to try and find even one decent opening and get a good crystallization. And, oh no. Sinta has the Final Fantasy XIV sound effect too. Help, the brain rot won't leave me alone. But we end on a boss refight. It's literally the exact same fight. But like, it has less HP. It might also be a little bit more aggressive. That could be just my annoyance at getting killed by it twice because I got greedy. At the top, Aldecor reveals to us that killing all the soldiers we have was actually a good thing. We've been feeding the tree. So the fact I didn't go and grind is a good thing story-wise, but gameplay made me even more fragile than intended. Shoot him already, Talia! Don't just stand there! Sinta, go nothing personnel, kid! Omai wo mo shinderu! No? Well, that's not good. This boss kind of sucks and is boring. Crystallizing doesn't seem to work except for, like, one point in the middle. I got two limit breaks the entire fight. The only real way to do decent damage is to do fusion magic, which opens up for limit break. And then halfway through he gets easier? The one undodgeable attack he has gets replaced with an extremely long, extremely telegraphed explosion that you just need to whip a stone on the outside to dodge. Hell, Stewie just says to jump. Maybe I don't even need the stone. I don't know, I just really didn't like this. Maybe fatigue of the game overall was setting in as I approached the 42 hour mark. But I really did not like playing as Talia. Missing an entire part of the skill set doesn't help. Prove the point I made in the main game. Your power is so much lower without working to fill out your skill set. It's just 10 times worse in a condensed experience where every skill boost is huge. Me. Turns out, Aldecor wins. No shock, given we know how this all ends. But Talia was no bomb. In reality... Ciceris wakes. The tree was to summon him. And Talia, her life was part of it. With her death, Ciceris is freed and flies away. The end of Athia begins. Waking back in the present, the voice begins to speak once more. Ciceris is not the worst in the world. Something created him. Something the voice will tell us. Oh, I, I don't even know who I'm talking to. Who are you? I am one of the Tantas of Redda. Say what? The answers you seek lie beyond Athia's border. Come to me. I will be waiting. Wait, no, wait, just hold on, can you just- And so it ends, with a tease toward Forspoken 2, a game we likely never will get. I really didn't like this DLC, but the game overall I appreciate for the things it did do right. Unfortunately, the game acting like a proof of concept for a Forspoken 2 is not good enough for people to want to play it. But I can say wholeheartedly, while I didn't come out of this with a new favorite, maybe calling this a 6 out of 10, I can see why some people might love it. I'm not sure I would recommend the game unless it's on a hefty sale. Why play this when you could play Pikmin 4 instead? Or, if unlike me you have friends, you're probably playing Lethal Company for $10. I can also see why others might still hate it, even after giving it a chance. But that's the real shame of it all. The marketing was downright awful, so a lot of people didn't give it a chance. Luminous is now gone. But what most people seem to not mention is that they just folded into Square Enix, in a way that seemed to indicate that this would have happened even if Forspoken was a 10 out of 10. So it all comes down to reviews and sales for a sequel. Square has very, 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 very often come under fire for games underperforming after costing way too much money to create. Even games that did sell well, did review well, if Forspoken 2 ever happens, it's because someone truly believes in the project. Truly believes in Frey. And think of how polished a Forspoken 2 could play. But again, a problem. Forspoken 2 would need to be 
more than just polished. It would need to go further, be a worthy sequel to what an 8 out of 10 or higher for Spoken would be. Clean up the gameplay, more variety, less baggage, and make that Forspoken 1. Forspoken 2 needs to improve on that, so the bar is really high to reach. And then there's Stewie and the Marvelization of Media. There are real gems of dialogue in here, gems even in the Marvelization if you count the sociopath line. I sure don't. I was able to push through, but hearing the same quips over and over got old fast. Talking about ruins I just left, enemies I just ran past, and just being so annoying and smarmy. It's a thin line between sass and marvel. It's unfortunate that this was probably Forspoken's endgame. Okay, wow, that was a much bigger video than I was expecting, but I tried to keep it short. Tried. I am nothing if not thorough in my complaints and feelings. I was expecting something much more cut and dry, but it's plenty more complex a situation. I don't make doing these videos a habit, but like, I don't know, it's been something I've thought about for a long time. And I do like making reviews. Please hit the like button, comment, subscribe if you like what I do. Come play Final Fantasy XIV with us. I'm on Twitter, Twitch, and I have a Discord. All these can be found below. And please, share my video around or my channel in general. Support is very, very much appreciated. Sadly, the internet just works like that and I gotta get them views, or the YouTube robots will say, I'm not allowed to show people anything. So yeah, see you around for... things. And stuff. May the power of Anna did hogs lay waste to your enemies.